one day, um, my wife came up to me, and she said, uh, you know, I've been thinking about our relationship. We've been together a long time. We've done a lot of things. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, she's waxing, not, you know, nostalgia about our, our marriage. And then, uh, then she said, it's like we've gone from soulmates to cellmates. <laughs> she really said that. And I thought, what can I say after that, right? <laughs> so I say, that would make a great country song. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I got out of that. And so, I, <laughs> so now I'm going to subject you to it. When I first met you, I knew you would be mine I also wish I'd known back then What I learned in a short time Could have saved me heartache A whole lot of pain If we got married any other day I'd be a free man But looking back, it's funny, a good story we can tell. How we drove in one day from wedded bliss to hell. But I won't dwell on it. It really wasn't our fault. Without that flat tire, we would have never got caught. From soulmates to cellmates Did not take us long Standing on our wedding day Saying we did nothing wrong But the judge called us liars He said the footprints fit our shoes Honey, I said I'd walk through fire Just to be with you I didn't think I'd really have to. <laughs> As we drove from the chapel to a chorus of wedding bells, our plans began to unravel, but it was too early to tell. And stopping for that cold one to kick off the honeymoon, Slowed us down just enough for a coincidence to brew. And my newly painted pickup truck, now the same color as the vehicle description that the police had. But how could we know on the other side of town? A couple held up the bank and trust in a tux and a wedding gown. <laughs> Soulmates to sell me did not take us long. Standing on our wedding day saying we did nothing wrong. But the judge called us liars, said the footprints fit your shoes. Honey, I said I'd walk the fire just to be with you. Didn't think I'd have to do it barefoot, too. Well, they picked us out of the lineup, though they'd only seen us from behind. I guess a witness to one's demise is never hard to find. They took our phones and our fingerprints and a mugshot as well. Regrettably, lost the only key that would let us out of our cells. But the bed is not uncomfortable. The food, not half bad. Probably not much different than the honeymoon we would have had. 
the marital consummation could have been more fun if they had put us in the same cell instead of connecting one. Soulmates who cellmates did not take us long. Thank you. Some say there's a season, a time for every purpose. Some say there's a reason for all the things that hurt us. I don't know the master plan, just focus on the small. I plant potatoes in April garlic in the fall Grown up life's a busy mix startle stress and hurry Sometimes I can't help myself give in to the worry Other days I take it slow and listen when the birds call. I plant potatoes in April, garlic in the fall. Cause there's a time for doing taxes, a time for washing dishes, time for smelling roses. Time for catching fishes A time to read, a time to write A time to search for answers Time to leave your seat and join the dancers Some hope politicians Will be the ones to save us Others say the answer is to bow our heads to Jesus. Don't got much faith in praying, less in building walls. I plant potatoes in April, garlic in the fall. Cause there's a time for doing taxes. A time for washing dishes, time for smelling roses, a time for catching fishes, time to read, a time to write, a time to search for answers, a time to leave you a seat and join the dancers. There's a meditation in working for the future. Tender shoots, seeds, and hope, all things we can nurture. Each act of compassion shows we're in it for the long haul. Potatoes in April. Garlic in the fall I plant potatoes in April garlic in the fall Thank you. I've been working on a lot of uh, prose since um, December um, and this is uh, one I wrote in 1985, uh, and it's part of an anthology of po uh, short stories that I'm putting together. 
just passed yesterday. While watching Allison, my 11-year-old daughter, swimming with her girlfriend, unencumbered by life's frustrations or trials, I accepted for the first time that Elizabeth was not coming back. Her sudden illness and the surrealistic, surrealistic world surrounding the funeral left me in a daily catatonic state, preventing the pain. Allie had gone to counseling. It had helped, thank God, and she was dealing with the loss a lot better than I was. The girls were enjoying the last days of August when Allison yelled, Come on in, Dad. It's like bath water. I remembered Liz used to tease me about my need for Caribbean temperature water before I would swim or how long it, would, it took for me to get into the pool. I looked around, but nowhere did I see Liz. I missed her so much. The sun's glare kept my daughter from seeing my tears, tears that seemed too long in coming. In our family, tears were easily shed, yet after Liz was gone, the tears had not come. It's true our mind had its own way of protecting itself, defense, denial, distance. Now, 15 months later, 15 months after sending purple and white irises from our garden to rest with Liz, 15 months of hollow hours and empty sleep, I wept. Many times when I least expected while doing something around the house or allowing my mind the freedom to roam from its structured course, I would enter a period of time that included Liz. Sometimes it was a private moment, a tender encounter between two lovers who would walk holding hands around the streets of Boston, or more passionate times when our bodies were one and the sun illuminated, illuminated our erotic ballet. Like many dreams, I was the third person standing in the wings, watching all the action, unbeknownst to those observed. I watched Liz and me. They watched me. Our love was our identity. We were one, yet we were separate. I revisited those precious moments of the past, wanting deeply for them to be part of my present life and knowing, but unable to accept that these memories would always be with me, always be part of my life with Liz, but I would never be able to go back no matter how I yearned. I shivered in the blazing sun, and the soundless sounds swirled around me. I felt dripping water, unaware how long it had been falling on me, and looked up to see Allie. She was now my best friend, and I could not think of what to say to help her understand that I was feeling what I was feeling at this moment. Allie, twisting her long, wet hair, stood beside where I was seated, and she put her hand on my shoulder. Dad, we both love and miss her too, but you need to get yourself back to life, not just work and me. There it was. Too many junior romance novels or something, the daughter parenting the parent. We are always the wisest when we are the most innocent. Allie and I hugged for a long time. We both cried, and I felt better. That night, Allison and I went to the movies and then out to a make-your-own Sunday shop. The lines were long, and Allie was telling me about the dance camp that she had just returned from, and she wanted to show me some new steps. When we get home... Will you learn my new routines and dance with me? One of my passions was dancing, especially with Allie. Sure, I would love to. We talked about dance and troops performing locally, when from behind Allie a soft, strong voice said, Excuse me, I couldn't help overhearing our, your conversation on dance. Let me introduce myself. I am Jolie Denou. I am the city dance company director, and I'm beginning there and that is beginning their performances next week at the Wang Center. If you and your wife and daughter would like to attend, I will leave tickets at the box office. <clears throat> it will be wonderful. It will. It is wonderful that you and your daughter love dance so much. Please be my guest. Before I could respond, before her melodic voice had stopped singing in my ears, before I realized I was gaping at this beautiful svelte woman, who appeared as a mirage in a distant oasis with a delicate features and whose eyes, large and blue, never seemed to stop searching, before I could do anything other than appear dumbfounded, Allie spoke. Thank you. That would be really awesome, but you only have to leave two tickets. My mother is dead. Only a child could be so direct. A gentle look engulfed me from Jolene. Then she said it's settled. You will be my guest for the opening night, and afterwards the three of us will celebrate opening night and our new re 
a new friendship. Allie looked up and saw me smiling with tears gently cascading, cascading down my cheeks. Tears of joys, tears of sorrow. From today to tomorrow, the tears of the universe, sands will fill each step we travel. I was meeting new futures, but not forgetting my past. I knew Allie, and I would make it no matter where we journeyed. Thank you. This was uh, inspired by a trip I took around Ireland on a major tour. There were 48 of us uh, with my father. And uh, you'll see where I, I they, at one point they said, look at this beautiful hillside of rhododendrons. And then they told us things about rhododendrons. I looked at the rhododendrons, I looked at my father, and this is what I wrote. I want to glory in rhododendrons when they massively bloom magenta, pink, white, brassy red in large bushes, shouldering their way into the sight of passersby. Lovely, gorgeous even. Have you noticed nothing grows beneath them? Left alone, they take over space with stringy stems, an anxious outburst of leaves in your face, unaccompanied by compensating flowers. Can't be bothered to be merely pretty. They remind me of a sadly well-remembered man who knew naught of how to be a father. Didn't show you how to blossom by his tutelage. Just took over space, absorbed nutrient from the ground up, desperately discouraging growth in his vicinity. I want to glory in rhododendron bushes, but they're too busy bragging to entertain a compliment, too stingy to present perfume or show true beauty's compass by sharing common ground. Thank you. Because we were hearing poems of spring, this is called Wormageddon. Can those be earthworms scattered about here and there on a thin film of water risen from the saturated soil? Five, ten, Hundreds of layabouts on the driveway. Shades of purple, rose, and bloodless gray intestines. Sprinkled haphazardly, but curved into themselves like spoons, only too sickly looking and waterlogged, even for the birds, even for birds, to eat the worn party goers, achy and hungover, sleeping, strewn like some kind of drugged confetti, sleeping the sleep of the dead, not even the peeping of birds returned north to mate could wake, not even a giant spoon could spare the drenched earth bloated in their intestines. Would I not think Jackson Pollock abandoned the worms on my driveway after airbrushing, worms that surfaced like boats in locks from the saturated soil, only to meet the fate of tires here, the fate of feet there. Thank you. This one's called Where's Tom Waits? Um, I, I must say, you know, he, he, I had the pleasure of meeting him once, and his, he's very different from his persona. Um, you know, I thought maybe he would try to sell me a used watch or something, <laughs> but he's actually a very humble, gentlemanly, um, quiet person. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'll read the poem. Where's Tom Waits? Closing time, all the regulars spill from the gin joints, and I'm among them looking for Tom down the alley behind Boylston, where rats are the size of chinchillas or small guitars and hardly a star tucked as they are in the sky. I call his name out like a siren or a scuffle on the corner. Tell me, where's Tom? 
Where's he gone out of earshot in his overcoat, his voice smooth as sandpaper telling tales about railroad cars, slick jack on the radio, and the ghost of Keith Richards' guitar. He laughs that jailhouse laugh. All that for a buck, he says, and slips a quarter into the golden arms of the record machine. The dogs bay beneath lamp posts, all silvery with teeth like piano keys, a trombone cabaret, and around here only street lights keep their posture. Everything else is a crooked line, even the night's a little edgy, moonshine showing nothing but the whites of its eyes. Sure not a place for a lady like me about to roll the loaded dice as this, as if this time will be different from Boston to Chicago, Chicago to L.A., and all the crooked places my two-timing wallet escaped. Imagine Tom writing a letter to a bygone era, wishing it a do, with finger symbols as the band starts softly on electric bassoon. He lights up a lucky and tilts his hat forward, in good voice tonight as bats snap out of the bell tower, the room spins like an amusement ride, and he's gone. Now who will put out the dog dish? Who will call the strays to come back home? April may be cruel, and it's also sweet, I know that. So I pulled up some haiku uh, words that I had written several years ago and then changed, like the poet who said he changes his, his revises all the time. Okay, this is Peepers. Cold-blooded frogs and branches, hope sings evening prayer, April's ancient mystery. That was 2011. The other is wait, meaning wait. Light drenched with rain drops, today's sun lightens burden. My dry bones will add more weight. Those were my haikus for Mud Rain Spring. The crime is solved, but yet there remains a lingering mystery to solve. Why doesn't the detective feel whole? After interviewing so many, a vision of the world emerges, a wasteland ready to be explored. Up on the shoulder goes the bundle, everything the detective believes. Heavy, but not so much after all. The detective ends one tale, begins one more, just like in Exodus, one among the many. And this morning I figured out, I lost, I lost it again. I figured out how to describe the book. It's a field guide. And it's a field guide with four sections in which people come to terms with rock and water, plants, animals, and with being human and making things. Um, this is Kin, and it's the last one in the animals section. Crane, she said. Crane, a long yellow beak and gray feathers down by the water. We were in New England. I knew what she had seen, heron, great blue. But the magic for her, by some difference of birth or literature, lay all in the word crane, which she repeated as her son clapped his arms like a beak, having taken the bird as a version of his own body when it rose, unfolding impossible wings, he would follow, see us from the sky. The hell with names, I thought, and walked on. Hooray for the heron, 
for the crane, all of our kin. Pond cool and pleasant in the day. 